Hey, I want to kick into this kind of little, we're going to do a mini series. We're going to do a two week series on Here Come the Dreamers. But I wanted to start this morning by just talking about how words can be really crazy. I don't know about you, but for me, you can hear a word and it can mean almost extremes. Have you ever noticed that? Like, you know, I I know for me, when I was growing up, if something was bad, then it meant bad. Whereas you can talk to some of the younger people now and they'll talk about something being bad and they actually mean good. (laughs) Have you noticed that? Or, you know, when you're sick, oh, that's sick or I'm sick, that's a bad thing. Talk to the youth now. Oh, that's really sick. I'm like... Is that a good thing? Is that not, you know, not so good thing? Even what ridiculous, you know, I, for me, ridiculous was sort of was just a, a, a really crazy thing. Whereas ridiculous can be ridiculously good, you know. That that cake's just ridiculous. And if I was baking the cake, I'd, I'd take that. I'd take offence. It's like no, no, no. It's a good thing. It's good. It's, it's all right. The other the other word that I felt as we were, I was preparing for this morning was the word dreamer. You know, some of us, when we hear the word dreamer, we think of, you know, away with the fairies, you know, that, that old heads in the clouds, and it's almost a negative connotation. And yet this morning, what I wanted to look at is I want to look at some God dreamers, or particularly one God dreamer, who his head wasn't in the clouds at all, but, but had big faith and trusted God with big things. And I want to look at what does it mean for you and I to maybe have a heart of a God dreamer? What would it look for you and I to live lives, live our lives with this attitude of, I want to be a God dreamer. So today I want to look at one person in the Old Testament who's got a name very similar to his mentor's name. And so I'm going to go slowly with this so you pick it up. The the person I want to look at, his name is Elisha and he's in the Old Testament. And God sees and hears this faith-filled dreamer and he brings some of his dreams into reality. So we're going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 19 if you, if you get your, want to get your, your phones out or your Bibles out and have a look. We're, we're also going to have it on the screen. Just so that you know, there's a Bible app. You'll notice on the bottom there, there's a Version Bible app. And if you like to go through apps, if you go into the Version app, look for events. Click on events and look, look for Highlands Highfields. The same scriptures and points that come up on the TV will be there for you. And if you save that, that'll be saved for you to go back to to have a look at again. It's a great little tool that uh, is available every week when we preach. So I'm going to be looking there. Just some background. This guy, Elisha, I want to start with his mentor. Another guy whose name was Elijah. Okay, so we've got Elisha and Elijah. Different fella, don't get confused, we'll we'll talk this through. Now Elijah was one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. Bold, daring, he was a man full of faith. And Elisha wanted to be like Elijah. He saw him and he said, I want to be like that guy. To the point where Elisha had such big dreams that Elisha was bold enough to go to Elijah and say to him, I would love twice the blessing of your anointing. Oh, 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 can I have a double portion? So what you have from God, Elisha says to Elijah, can I have double that? Now some would go, gee, that's a bit presumptuous, isn't it? It's a bit ego driven. I actually think, how cool is that? What a dreamer. What a God dreamer to see one of the most powerful and the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. Not that he knew that at the time. But he said, See what you've got. Oh, I want double that. God, could I have double that blessing? What a beautiful dream of of being open to all that God might be able to have and bring. In 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 9, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? So Elijah, we've moved ahead a little bit and I'll come back to the story of Elisha, but Elijah's about to be taken up to God and if you to heaven. And if you want to know an amazing story about what happens there, check out first and second Kings about what happens with Elijah himself and how he goes to be with God. Pretty amazing. Anyway, I'll leave that there for you to go and check out during the week. But Elijah says to, to his young protege, So before I go, what can I do for you? And here it is. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replies. How bold. What a a God dreamer. Hey, I've seen what you've done for God and I'd love to be able to have a double portion of that. What do you reckon? (laughs) And God gave Elisha this double portion of anointing. And Elisha then went on to perform more recorded miracles in Scripture than anyone ever apart from Jesus. So even that small 
story, and we'll under, unpack a little bit more about Elisha's life, but, but all he did was he said, I see this guy who's had, having an incredible impact for you, God. Could I be like him? Actually, no. Could I have a double portion? Could I, could I actually step into even double that? I know it's a big responsibility, but I'm going to ask a big thing. I'm going to dream a big dream with you, God, if that's possible. And the scripture says, God answered that prayer. God answered that desire. And he went on and he did even greater works than Elijah and performed more miracles than anyone except Jesus himself. That's where I want to start the foundation of this message. What would it look like for you to be a God dreamer? So let's look back at the journey of this bloke, Elisha. What's interesting about this guy is he starts out as a pretty normal guy, just like you and I. He wasn't the son of a priest. He wasn't a monk. He hadn't gone to Bible college. He hadn't done a whole lot of things. He wasn't a spiritual giant. He was just a guy going through the motions of life. In fact, let's look at it. This ordinary guy living at home with his parents, working on the farm, when God called him to dream big dreams and do something significant with his life. So here's the context. He's living during kind of ninth century in time when Israel was divided. There's huge tension going on and many people were, were worshipping false prophets and, and false gods. Baal was one of the false gods that everybody started to worship. And they were moving away from God. And, and so, so holy God starts stirring and raising up people. And he raises up this ordinary guy to do extraordinary things because he was prepared to have God dreams. Prepared to say, God, I believe you can do amazing things in me and through me. So, let's look at it. 1 Kings chapter 19. That's where I pointed you to right from the start. That's our core text for this morning. 1 Kings chapter 19. I'm going to read from verse 19. So, Elijah. So, this is when Elijah and Elisha kind of first met. So, Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. So, think of it. They were, they, were, they were driving, if you like, they were ploughing with, with 12 yoke of oxen and he was at the back. Can you imagine that? You've got all these oxen, 12 oxen normally matched up, so you've probably got six teams and he's right at the back of all of them, getting all the dust and everything else as he's walking behind them. I just want, to, want you to get in that moment a little bit. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. And Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. And he said, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come to you. Go back, Elijah said. What have I done to you? So I'll unpack that and what that means. But if we go back to that, go back, what have I done to you? If you look at the Hebrew, what he's actually saying is, go ahead. You're free to, you're free to respond how you want to. He's basically saying, out of respect for my parents, I want to go and say goodbye first. And what Elijah is saying, well, I've done my job. I've, I've thrown the cloak over you and I've called you. And I'll explain what throwing the cloak over means. Now, the rest is between you and God. You do what you think you need to do. And so verse 21, so Elisha left him and he went back. And he took his yoke of oxen and he slaughtered them. And he burned the ploughing equipment to cook meat. And he gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and he became his servant. So here's, here's this guy, Elisha, and he's doing the same job that he's been doing for a long, long time. He's ploughing fields with yoke of oxen. He's working on his parents' farm, ploughing with 12 yoke, and he's driving the 12th pair himself. So here's what I want you to do in this moment. I want you to imagine what it would be like to plough behind a yoke of oxen every day. It's an image on the screen of someone doing that with just one yoke. You can imagine that you've got, you've got the two and then you've got another two and another two and, another, and he's right behind all of them. In the heat of the day, dust everywhere, getting all the smells that oxen smell and seeing something fall as they continue to and walking over the top of whatever oxen produce trying to keep it clean you know you talk about the word something it's a bit sick and I said sick could be a good or bad thing this is a bad thing you would feel sick or you get used to it as you walk through the residue from the oxen every day and this is what you'd see day after day after day oxen bums 
every day, day after day, after day after day, getting the smells. This is, this is what they're experiencing. He's experiencing day after day after day. The truth is, maybe not to this degree, but some of us live a lives where it's day after day after day and we feel a little bit the same. Day in, day out, monotonous job, same job, same co-workers, same people, you're almost feeling like you're staring at the, I'm not calling your workers ox and bums, but, but you know, you're seeing the same things, you're doing the same things, you're going through the same, and you're almost going through the motions. Now, I'm not saying that work that's monotonous is wrong, but sometimes that becomes our life and it becomes this monotonous day after day, day after day. So I don't want you calling your co-workers ox and bums this week, but what I do want you to do is just start to think about what would it look like for you as you're being faithful with what you're doing, seeking God for big dreams. Because in the middle of what he was doing, he was faithful, but he kept seeking God for big dreams. So you might be going day after day in your sales, and every day you're just doing, you're in the sales industry, and you're selling, and you're selling, or study, you're a student, and you're studying, and you're studying, and you're studying, or parents, and you're doing, being a taxi, and you're doing laundry, and you're being a taxi, and you're doing laundry. You know, you're doing the same thing over and over again. Your life becomes this Groundhog Day existence, and it's incredibly easy to lose passion. Incredibly easy to lose passion for life when you feel like this. And some of us today would feel like where Elisha was at. But I want you to notice something. He was faithful. He was faithful in his task at hand and he was ready. He continued to do what he was supposed to do in that season of ploughing the fields behind the oxen. But as, as he was doing that faithfully, he was ready. And he was dreaming God dreams. And he was ready to respond when the moment was right. I believe with all my heart that God loves to reward those who are faithful in the moment, but who continue to dream God dreams. So what am I saying right now? I'm saying wherever you're at, be faithful in what you're doing right now, but dream God dreams and be open for God to speak. You know, Proverbs 16 verse 3 says, commit to the Lord whatever you do. That's anything. Whatever you do, commit it to God. I'm a teacher, commit that to God. I'm a parent, commit that to God. I'm a husband, commit that to God. I'm a student, commit that to God. I'm a follower of Jesus, commit that. Commit it to God, whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. So even though it might be his favourite job to do, Elisha was faithful to his work and to his God. So he realised and understood when the prophet Jeremiah said, For I know the plans I have for you, Elisha, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. He realised that the words from that prophet echoed through the generations and were right for him. I trust you. I know you've got big plans for me, God. Help me to see those big plans, but I'm going to be faithful in what I know right now. So I'm not going to be so faithful but my head's down and I'm not aware of what God's saying and what God's doing. But I'm not going to be so airy-fairy that I'm not consistent in what I'm called to do. This is leading somewhere. See, in the middle of this daily routine that Elisha was on, where he was remaining faithful, God shows up. And he sends someone new to take him from where he was into a new place. So in the middle of his faithfulness, get this, in the middle of his faithfulness, while he's dreaming God dreams, Elijah comes across his path. And in verse 19, Elijah went up to him and threw his coat around him. So let me explain what that means to throw his coat around him. Because it's a significant moment. We would think, well, is he cold? And just helping him. No, no, no. There's more significant meaning to that. See, the cloak, which was made out of probably either animal skin or fur, was what was known as Elijah's covering. And it represented this covering that God had placed over him. And so when he took his coat and he placed it over Elisha, what he was symbolically saying was, that which is the, the God covering that's been on me, God wants me to place it over you. That you now have a mantle that I've been walking in that God wants to place it over you. This mantle that's on me is now on you. This, you will be my student and I will be your teacher. And I'm calling you, would you come and leave what is and come and walk with me? And this mantle from God is being placed over you. But I want us to understand that he did it as Elisha was in the middle of being faithful with what he was called to do. Faithful with what he was doing, but dreaming big dreams. Segway. How are you going at dreaming big dreams with God? 
When's the last time you sat with God and said, God, I'm going to be faithful with what, you, what I'm doing right now and what you're calling me to do right now, but I'm believing you for big things. I want to be a dreamer of big God dreams. And I believe in a big God who wants to do big things in me and through me. Because this is where Elisha was. That's what put him to this place. So what I want to do right now is look at two principles that we can apply from Elisha's life that can help us to be the same faithful dreamer that Elisha was. This man who goes on to do incredible things for God, but started walking behind ox, being faithful. Let's watch how an ordinary man with big God dreams responds to an extraordinary call as he walks with Elijah. So the first principle, if you want to write this down, this is something you'll hear me see a lot, say a lot over the next few days, weeks, months and years. The first principle of being a God dreamer is that you don't have to understand fully to obey God immediately. You don't have to understand fully to obey God immediately. Think about it. Guy comes up, puts his jacket over, over Elisha. Elisha says, I'm with you. I'm sure he had a lot of questions. Wouldn't you? See, when God calls you to do something, you don't have to understand all of the details to obey straight away with what you do know. God says to us, be obedient with what you do know and trust me with what you don't. See, that's the life of a Christian. The life of a Christian is, God, show me, and I always pray this, pray, give, me, give me the big picture, show me everything. And God say, says, you can't handle all that. Oh, let me just, let, take this. Take this. And if you step into this, then I'll... Who's seen... There's a, I, I just thought of it then. Who's seen the um, Indiana Jones movie? I'm not sure which one it is. And he stands on a crevice, and he looks over the edge, and it's like there's nothing there. Has anyone... Okay, great. Shout out the, the, which, which one it was, if anyone knows. Nobody knows. I'm not sure. That's okay. But he stands at the crevice and he looks over and there's nowhere to go. And I think a big rocks, a big boulder's after him or people are Someone's always after Indiana Jones. But he's at this crevice and nowhere to go. And, and it's, it's called the faith gap or something. And anyway, he sees a step, one step, one rock. And he steps on that. And as he steps into the nothingness of one and he leaves there, then he gets to see another. And you don't see the steps until you take your first step. You stand back here, all you see is one step. You don't see anything else. But until, and then he takes that step, and then the next one shows up. And he takes that step, and that's all he sees until he puts his And then he sees the next one. You know, I think God does that sometimes. He says, trust me. He, he says, be obedient with what you do know, and trust me with what you don't. And I'll provide for you. I'll show you. Verse 20 said, Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. He left him in that moment and he runs after Elijah. He didn't have to go off for a month and pray about it for a month. He didn't have to list out the pros and cons. He didn't have to wait until he's fine. Oh, hang on, I'm just going to go away and do the books and see if my finances are all right. None of those things are wrong. Praying for a while about it is not a, not a wrong thing to do. Putting a list of pros and cons, that's a good thing to do. But he knew that he knew it was right. So he just stepped in. He just stepped in. All he did was say, God, I believe you're in this. I don't understand all the details. But since I believe you're on it, I'm going to obey immediately. Such a simple faith, if you think about it. Such a simple faith. You know, through the week, this week, I had the privilege of, of um, officiating um, a wonderful lady's funeral. And Gloria lived a beautiful, wonderful life. And I had the privilege of, of um, sitting down with, with Jill, um, Gloria's daughter, and, um, and Kev. And we talked a little bit in preparation. I said, tell me a bit about Gloria. I knew Gloria from previous church I pastored, but didn't know her well. And uh, we talk, shared stories. And um, I found out that Gloria was 92 when she passed away um, last week. And she was baptised at 79. She made a decision for Jesus in her later years and was baptised. And there's this beautiful photograph at the funeral of Gloria being baptised. And it was just such a beautiful photo. And I asked a little bit about her faith. And Jill said, quite simply, her faith was this. She said she used to say regularly, I prayed to God and I found him. I prayed to God and I found him. You know, we compliment, complicate things sometimes. Well, I need to know this and this and this and this and this and then I'll... Whereas God just says, I'm calling you, will you follow me? 
Will you trust me? And I'll show you as we go on the journey. Whereas I don't know about you, but I want to have all the answers first. Well, how many know that that's not faith? Now, God doesn't say, take your brain out. That's not what I'm saying. But he does say, will you have faith to believe and walk with me and trust me? Philippians 4 verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul's saying, put your, put your trust in God and watch. Watch what I can do in you. So let me ask you this question. When God prompts you, do you act? When God opens opportunities, do you respond? Do, do you understand the voice of God in your life? Because God wants to show you. He wants to reveal to you. He wants to encourage you to take those steps. So maybe rather than being so caught up on planning your life out, maybe get this, instead of planning for the future, maybe it's best to plan on responding in the present. Let me say that again. Rather than planning out your future, what would it look like for you to plan to respond in the present? You don't have to understand completely to obey immediately. One of the greatest examples that I can remember, this is a previous church that Kaz and I had the privilege of planting as a church, plant on the Mornington Peninsula and seeing God breathe over it and, and grew it incredibly over the, over the next 10 years. Um, we used to uh, meet on the Mornington Peninsula in a church on the Mornington Peninsula and we started as a, in a home church and then it grew and we moved eight times in 10 years and it just grew exponentially. It was amazing. But we met near the beach on the Mornington Peninsula, as you would, beautiful part of Melbourne or Victoria. And we used to do baptisms on the beach which was amazing in summer, freezing cold in winter. A lot of people got baptised in summer, not many in winter. No, no. But, um, but I remember this one, one day, what we used to do is we'd, we'd have baptisms and I just felt God prompt me this one day. You know, we'd, we'd met with some people and they decided they wanted to be baptised and I felt God prompt me this one day as we'd finished baptisms or while we were talking about baptism, I said, you know, if you're here right now and you love Jesus and you feel like now is the right time for you to be baptised, you don't have to do a baptism course. The Bible says believe and be baptised. If you're a believer and you, you trust in God and you want to be baptised, why, why don't you ask God and seek if he want, might want you to do that right now. And so we used to meet on the beach. The church was called Liquid Church, which I love. You know, we called it Liquid because it was near the beach and near the water, but also the fact that we believe that God's spirit is like, like liquid. It just floats and flows through and finds every little area. And There's lots of different things which I won't talk to him too much about. But we used to meet on the beach. And on this one particular day, I think we had planned six baptisms. Let me show you a picture. The next picture will show you exactly how many baptisms we had. We had 13 baptisms that day. 13 baptisms that day. Now... You would say, well, what, what happened? People had God dreams. People didn't have to understand completely to obey immediately. Every one of those people loved Jesus. Some of them were fairly new in their faith. Some had been Christians for a while. Some of them were teenagers. But they were all at a place and space in their life where God was saying, I'm calling you now. And they went, I'm ready. And so we saw God multiply six people or six or eight people who had planned to be baptised into 13 people. Parents were there jumping in the water. There was Lucy. I think Lucy, Lucy was part of four girls. I think all four sisters got baptised that day. Incredible. She's now, Lucy's now involved with Christian surfers, doing amazing work. She's moved up, up to Queensland as well, and she's doing, doing amazing work there, and a whole bunch of other stories for another day. But that was a great example of, well, I don't understand fully, but I, but I understand I love Jesus and I understand Jesus wants me to do this. And I know that my life, my being, being born again is a, is a death of my old life and the beginning of new. I want to step into this moment. Powerful. Powerful. People responding in the moment to the call of Jesus on their life. And later on this morning, there's going to be an opportunity for you no matter where you're at, to respond to Jesus wherever he's at in that space as well. So for some of us, that responding in the moment might be God saying one word. And for you in that one word, you would respond. That's what happened in the scriptures. In the Old Testament, God wanted Moses to, to go in a certain direction. And if you summarise what, what God said to Moses and what he said to Abraham, he just said, go. And sometimes there was a wrestle, but then they stepped into that. Some of you may be in a marriage right now and you're really struggling in your marriage. You're struggling together. You, you feel like you're getting further and further apart and you're, you're, you may even be weighing up your options in your marriage. And in this moment right now, God might be saying to you, stay. 
He might be saying, you mightn't understand fully, but he's saying, will you stay? Will you press him? Will you trust me? Maybe for health. And you're looking at your health and you're looking at what's happening in your health and, and you're thinking, why is all this happening? And God just says, trust me, trust. Or maybe there's an idea that's been going on in your mind and you've been praying about and praying about and you can't get rid of it and you feel like God's in it. And maybe right now God's word for you is start. Or maybe you've been hanging around church for a while and you know, you'd know you sort of say, you, this, this is the church I attend and maybe it's time that God's saying, it's time for this to be your church. And maybe he's saying, commit. Or maybe you're a great single girl and you're dating a jerk. And maybe God's been giving you a word for a while and that word, well it's five words, break up with that jerk. You know, maybe, maybe he's saying to you, will you wait for the person that's right? Will you trust me? Will you trust me? Will you wait? And it's just one word, but it can have the power to do incredible things. Maybe you're seeking God for something significant in your life. And God's just saying trust. I don't know what it is for you, but we don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. And then finally, the second thing that I think we can learn in this whole faith journey is that those God uses the most are the ones who hold on to the least. Those God uses the most are the ones that hold on to the least. Let's watch what Elisha does. So Elisha gets called by Elijah. Elisha leaves him and he goes back and he sees his parents, and then watch, watch, watch what he does next. Verse 21. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He buried the ploughing equipment to cook meat, and he gave it to the people, and they ate. And then he set out to follow Elijah and to become his servant. Do you get how significant this is? He took his yoke of oxen, the animals that had bought his livelihood all of his life, and what's the Bible say he does? He, he slaughters the animals. He slaughters the ox. And then the ploughs, he doesn't set them along so offside. He doesn't put them in a, in, a, in, a, in a shed for later just in case. He burns the ploughs. He burns the ploughs and kills the cows. What's he saying? There's no plan B. There's not, oh, just in case I'm going to come back to, oh, I'll just put this aside just in case. No, 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 I trust you, God, and I might not have all the answers. But I'm not going to hold on to what was. I'm going to step fully into what is. Let me say that again. I'm not going to keep holding on to what was, even though that's what I knew. I'm going to step in to what you're saying, God, fully. I'm going to trust you. Now, we do this when? When we know that we know that we know it's God. So I'm not saying you went out last night and you had some pizza and maybe it was bad pizza and you got up this morning and got this whole new idea. Right, I'm doing this now. And God, can you bless it? That's not what it's not, it's not I'm doing this, God, you bless it. I'm saying God drops, you're praying, you're seeking God, and you, you, you this sense of around this is God, this is you. And this is what I'm going to step into. He's saying, I'm burning plan B. There's only obeying God. You see, here comes the God dreamer. Here comes the God dreamer. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things shall be added to it. Where does it start? God, what are you saying? My sense is this, so I'm going to take a faith step. I'm going to take this step. I'm going to step into what you're saying, God. I'm going to let go of what was. I'm going to let go of what people are saying. I'm going to trust in what you're saying. I'm going to step into that for you. We say... Keep the plows and the cows, because you never know. What if it doesn't work? Well, you've always got plan B. God says, just trust me. Just trust me. Right through the Scriptures. Think about the fisherman, Peter. He encounters Jesus for the first time. He's having a bad fishing day. He's catching nothing. Jesus says, throw, the, throw your nets over the other side. Peter says, you don't know what you're talking about. I've been fish I'm a fisherman. You're a bloke who talks a lot. I'm the fisherman. I'm the skilled guy here. I've been fishing all day and caught nothing. Jesus says, just do it. This is paraphrasing a little bit, but this is the way I see it happening. Jesus says, just do it. He saw her. He does. So many fish, nets started to break. Through Peter's eyes, no fish there. No future here. No hope here. When God's in it, more than we can even cope with. 
I choose that than what I know. I choose what God says rather than what I feel is best or safest. Look at his response. Peter and his brother leave everything. They drop their nets to leave them and say, I want to follow you. I want to be about what you're about, Jesus. What did they do? They burnt their plows and killed their cows. They dropped their fish, fishing nets, and they went and they moved forward. What would it mean when we say, I've decided, we sing this song, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. That means you and I are God dreamers. If we really believe that, we're going to live that out, I want to be a God dreamer. God, you've given me this business. I want to be the best I can be at this. And I'm, so it, it, it's whatever it is God's saying for you to do. Step into that, trusting Him with that. It's part of what Jenna's doing. I don't understand fully, but I really feel like God's in this. I feel like I have a role to play here to support the amazing team we've got in the kids' ministry. I don't get the full big picture. I don't even know that I like the title pastor because who am I to be? This is what she said to me. Who am I to be a kids pastor? And I went, that's exactly what we're looking for. Humility of heart, but I'm going to step into what God says because I think this is God and I'm going to trust Him with it. That's the sort of kids pastor I want. I don't know about you. That's the sort of kids pastor I want looking after our kids, sowing faith into our kids along with all the other great team. I don't know what it might be for your life. But if there's anything keeping you from following God, you've got to burn that player. You've got to kill that cow. So, what would it look like for you to be a God dreamer, firstly? And really believe that God's going to show you plans and purposes for your life. And then what would it look like for you then to not just hear, be prompted, be nudged, but what would it look like for you to take that faith step? Step into what God's got for you. If sin's holding you back, burn that plough. If doubt in your life and who you are is holding you back, kill that cow. If addiction is holding you back, burn the plough. Step away from it. If it's laziness or an unhealthy relationship, whatever it might be that's holding you back from stepping in to what God's calling you to be, burn the plough, kill the cow. You see, you don't have to understand fully to obey God immediately. And those who God uses the most are those who hold on to the least. I love those two points because it's saying you don't have to be perfect. God sees you exactly where you are and He says, come on, walk with me. Come on, walk with me. Trust me. Watch what I can do in your life. Watch what I can do in the life of the church. And for some of you, this is a whole new way of seeing life. Whose better hands would you like to put your life in than the one who died for you on a cross 2,000 years ago and said, I give my life that you might have a personal relationship with Jesus? Because that's what Jesus did. Did you might have a personal relationship with God, the Father. I'm going to give my life so that you can walk with Him and you can experience the fullness of life with Him. Our response, let's burn the plows and kill the cows of the past as soon as God says, this is what I'm calling you to. Not before. Be faithful with what you're doing until God speaks. But when He speaks, whatever that looks like, step into those moments. Never forget this. To step towards your dreams and your destiny, sometimes we have to step away from our security. Let me say that again. To step towards your dreams and your destiny, sometimes we have to step away from our security. I believe this morning that someone's, God's speaking to someone and He's calling you to something new. Maybe it's to step into a new ministry. Maybe it's to, to start to speak to God a little bit more about maybe roles and responsibilities. Maybe it's a new idea He's dropping in. Maybe it's the way that you're living your life at the moment. He wants to say, come on, come on, let's burn the plough of the way you've always done and spoken to people. We're going we're gonna to do this a new way moving forward. You know, that, that attitude that I'll, at work, we all speak like this at work. Maybe God's saying, burn that plough, kill that cow. I'm calling you to be different. I believe this morning God's speaking big dreams into some of us. And He's going to continue to do that. Are you open to Him? Are you ready? Are you ready? Because God at Highlands, 
Here come the dreamers. Here come the dreamers. Here we come, God. We're coming to you with dreams. We're coming to you ready. We're coming to you open. We're ready to be called by you. We're ready to step into what you call us to do. We're not going to be held back by our own insecurities. We're ready, God. When you speak, we act. We don't have to know it all. We just have to know it's you. And when we know it's you, and we know that we know, we're stepping into it, and we're believing in incredible things. Would you stand to your feet?